and okay so it is setting it up and we should be good all right <clears throat> it is showing that we are live and so uh welcome everybody this is joe massaro with the yahweh sisterhood book club and i am extremely extremely excited today because we get to bring back rita Gerlich, who is just I consider her a friend, uh, a mentor in some ways as well. I just love her writing. And we are here to discuss a lot of things today. So I hope you join us. And when you're viewing this, please subscribe to the channel so you can hear some other uh, great authors as well. So welcome, welcome, welcome. If I didn't say it enough, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh. So yeah. Oh my goodness. We're going to be discussing her newest book, Wait Until Morning, but we have lots of a few things to discuss before that. Let me just share with uh, everyone a, a little bit about you. Okay. Uh, and this actually answered one of my questions, as I, a couple of questions as I read through this. Ever since I was knee high to a flea, I would dream up stories. I loved books and illustrations and going to the library or climbing into a bookmobile to explore. The books on the shelves were a special treat when I was a kid. Writing was within me, but it wasn't until a day in the early 90s at a family reunion that my cousin, a famous romance author, handed me a copy of one of her books that the spark ignited into a fire to write. Woo! I just love that. <laughs> I took many paths to find my calling and the joy of following through on it has been a tremendous part of my life journey. In many of my stories, I write about the struggles endured by our early colonists with a sprinkling of both American and English settings. Currently, I am writing a new historical romance set in the Gilded Age, along with writing a series in collaboration with a best-selling Christian, with best-selling Christian author. More on that later. Woohoo! I can't wait to hear that. My books are, and I like this about you. My books are dramatic in the sense I don't hold back on the trials people historically faced. So you won't find stories made of sugar and syrup. I'm blessed to live near the Potomac River where some of my novels are set. I live with my husband and two sons and an affectionate feline named, is it Pookie? Well, that, no, Pookie's gone. <laughs> Pookie passed away. I have Max, I have Max and Taz. Okay, Max and Taz. Both rescue cats, yeah. Oh, beautiful. In a historical town nestled along the, what is it, mountains? Catoctin. How do you pronounce that? Catoctin. Oh, yes, the in Catoctin. central Maryland. Yeah. And we're going to post how you can uh, connect with uh, Rita and just check out all the great things she has on her website and her author page on Facebook. So we, I'll provide that. You'll see that with the video. Um, but so this is actually the third time that you're with us. Yes. Yes. So let me just think. We discussed uh, Mercy, Mercy's Refuge yeah. and After the Rain. Rain. Yes. Two wonderful books. Thank you. And uh, someone told me that there is writing the sequel to Mercy's Revenge. Oh, Mercy's Refuge. Oh, Refuge. Sorry. No, Mercy's that's okay. Refuge. Yes. yes. As a matter of fact, Joe, you're the one that prompted me to do that. You asked me in the interview, are you going to write a sequel? Well, and it's said, such a wonderful book. And I said, well, I'm going to, I'll think about it. So it, you prompted that and I am, I'm writing a sequel to it. It's called The Waymaker wow. and it'll be set in 1693. And the heroine is the great granddaughter of Mercy and Caleb Tremaine. Wow. The, the main characters in Mercy's Refuge. And if my memory is correct, and you know, it may not be because I read so much, but it starts it starts in England and it's journeying over to America. Yes, it goes from England to Holland. Yes. They were Holland. part of this separatist group that was on the Mayflower and then over to to uh, to America to Plymouth. Mm -hmm. So Mercy's Refuge, listen to me, don't, don't listen to me at times. Mercy's Refuge. It's okay. And, um, it's all right. 
It's a wonderful, wonderful book. So I encourage you to get that. You can get it and read it by the time. Get ready for the sequel coming now. Uh, and then After the Rain, which was an incredible book as well. I just love the cover of that. It's just so beautiful. I have, I self-published that book and I have a wonderful cover designer named Hannah May Linder. And she did the cover for After the Rain and for Wait Until Morning. Wow. She's exceptional. She's also a young, budding author. Wow. See, we've been around you long enough, it kind of uh, wears off on me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think so, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. she's, she's great. She's very, art. she's just, her, her covers are, sometimes I see covers coming out by major publishers and they can't hold a candle to some of the work that she does, so. Well, yeah, that's another great book to get. Um, just beautifully written. And I said to you before we started, when I grow up, I want to learn to write like Peggy Sue Wells and Rita Gerlich. And there's a bunch of other authors in there, but I am, I just, it's pretty high I'm transformed. I'm transformed into the time period and the history. And I love history. So these are just incredible stories that you write. Uh, and we're going to get into that, but first I want to ask you a few questions. Okay. So I think we kind of touched on this. Um, how old were you when you started writing and why did you become an author is one of the questions. Yeah. Oh my goodness gracious. The first story I ever wrote, I was uh, about 11 or 12 years old and it was with a friend from school. And it was, we did illustrations to the story and it was about a little girl who found an abandoned horse mm. and it was fun, right? So, but you know, then you know, later on, but I guess I started seriously writing in my thirties. Um, and like you read before that I had gone to a family reunion, my cousin was there I'm not going to name drop, but um, she and I talked and I told her that I had been wanting to to do some writing and that kind of got the ball rolling, you know, I, she just told me, well, just start doing it. So I got a, I got a note, but it was a rebel's pledge was my first book <laughs> and I got a big binder with loose leaf paper and I wrote the entire book on the loose leaf paper. Wow which is, I still have, I still have the binder. Um, and this is back in, oh gosh, the 90s, uh, early 90s, before we had some of the technology that we have now. Sure. Um, this was back in the day when you'd have to take a manuscript and you'd have to put it in a self-addressed stamped, with a self-addressed stamped envelope in a big envelope yes. and send it out hoping that you wouldn't get rejections, but it was a grueling process to have to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, so things have changed a lot in industry, but um, yeah, so it was the early nineties. It was the, Re the Rebel's Pledge really wasn't my first thing I ever wrote. Um, I wrote a little novella just to see if I liked doing it. And I did, I was like, I love doing this. So. Well, that's wonderful. A lot younger than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> just, I am. I'm just not a go. Huh? So, I'm sorry. I just said I'm just a, f a few years, you know, young, um, but that's okay. You know, I believe that God gives us gifts and no matter how young or how old we are, you know what, that God will continue to use us. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, I'm sorry. That's, that's my computer. Okay. Just a minute. I'm just going to, there you go. There you go. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'm hoping that the Lord allows me many more years to, to continue to write because I have Amen. other books. I have other books in my heart that I'd like to do. So. Okay. So why, why do you think you wanted to write? You know, I mean, for somebody like me, I, it wasn't in my, my uh, journey. It wasn't something that, oh, yeah, I'm going to become a writer. I'm going to, I want to become an author. Um, that happened to me three years ago. That's a really good question is it, it's, I can't really pinpoint one specific event 
or experience that did that. Um, I always loved stories. And, you know, I was really, you know, as a kid, just, if my mother was here, she would tell you that I was always telling stories, <laughs> you know? I mean, I can remember being like too short to see over the kitchen counter mm -hmm. and I still can see her in my mind washing dishes. There goes my Washingtonian accent, by the way. Oh, yes, that's my mom. <laughs> that would be my mom, too. <laughs> and she was washing dishes. I was probably about three or four years old. And I'm, I'm telling her something, you know, and I'm, and then her looking down at me going, Riri, are you telling me a story? And I'm, yes. You yeah. know, and, and I was always doing that. Um, and then, you know, uh, after life happens, you know, in my 20s and everything, I, you know, as we started settling down and having our kids and everything, I started, uh, I started reading really old books. Mm -hmm. um, we have a used bookstore here. And I went down there one day and I found this, these authors that were famous during the turn of the last century, you know, late 1800s early 1900s um, and started reading these older novels, yeah. um, some even into the 40s, yeah. 1940s, and was just, I was blown away at the quality of the writing. Um, and then, you know, other authors like Mark Twain, he's one of my favorites, and Jane Austen. Jane Austen. Um, and I just, I couldn't really get myself attached to all the like the romance books that were coming out in the 80s, you know, from the 80s on, you mm -hmm. know, the Harlequin stuff and all that. But I found these books were amazingly written. I mean, the writing was just, mm -hmm. you know, I read this, I'll, I'll give you an example. Robert Chambers, who, you know, was famous then, people probably never heard of him now. And he wrote these books that really for for I think boys, but um, they were historical novels yeah. and just incredible writing and descriptive narrative that, you know, just it, it, a lot of it seemed like it had it, the writing that I was, you know, the more modern stuff was kind of watered down a lot to me. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say that I, I haven't read some other, um, you know, authors that today that are exceptional. I have most of them, you know, they're Christian authors. Yes. And a few secular ones. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. But I think it did. I think it really did. And, you know, I, I have, this is like the third or fourth book that I have read of yours. So um, let me just kind of pivot into this. So what is your favorite genre to write? Oh, definitely historical fiction. Yes, I could have answered that, but <laughs> I wanted you to. Yeah, definitely historical fiction. I mean, yeah. I just, and even up now, I've, you know, I've, I've written uh, Wait Until Morning and After the Rain and a, and a couple novellas for Barber that were set, you know, like World War I, World War II. So I kind of was like, I was moving up. <laughs> yes. So for the 1600s, <laughs> I kept like moving, moving forward a little bit, you know. Now I'm back, uh, further back. But I do have to tell you this, it kind of links in with what we were just talking about, about, you know, getting, getting my writing career going. Mm -hmm. Because with writers, there's always, there's that spark, you want to start writing. But then there's the other side of the coin of, do you want to be published? Mm -hmm. And that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> It's not separated from your writing, but it's, you know, it's like the next step, right? So what, again, my computer did that. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I keep forgetting to we know you're there. Do my, I have to be, move my cursor around a little bit. So, <laughs> but I, I want to say this really quick. What happened to me was quite amazing. I had um, found this small press back in 1999. And I, and I let them have the Rebels Pledge and they, they were not a good publisher. Mm. They, they, 
I won't go there. They just were not a good publisher. It did not work out very well for me with them. So anyway, I, I was praying one day. This is back in about 2008. And, you know, Lord, if you want me to, to go on in, in publishing, just I'm just going to trust you to open the door. Mm -hmm. That very day that I prayed that, um, I had this thought to go onto Brandy Lynn Collins's website and look at her blog. It was just, you know, go look at her blog. So I go on there and I'm, I see she's put this thing up about Barbara Scott is the new editor at Abington Press and they have, they're opening up a line of fiction. Wow. And she's looking for new authors. And if you're interested to query her through her email address and tell her that, you know, I, that we find out through Brandy Lynn's blog. So I did, I just queried Barbara and she said that day, she said, send me your manuscript. Wow. And that was for Surrender the Wind, which was a, a, a historical Christian romance. And uh, yeah, so she, you know, about a few days later, she called me and said, uh, you know, we've accepted your manuscript. We want to publish it. <laughs> so they did. And that got me um, uh, with them, with Surrender the Wind and the Daughters of the Potomac series, mm -hmm. which is three books. And this past spring, they gave my rights back. Was it the spring or the fall? I can't remember. Um, sometime this year, they okay. gave me the rights back to Surrender the Wind. And I had Hannah May Linder do a new cover. And the new cover is just perfect for it. So I reissued it. It's up on Amazon. Same book, just reissued through me. But that's, that's kind of how I got started in, in Christian publishing was through Barbara Scott and Abington Press, Brandy Lynn Collins. It, it just goes to show you that God is the one that opens up the doors he if, sure you, if you let him. Yes. And it yeah. takes patience. Boy, yes, it you know, does, doesn't it? You have to be patient, wait. And so he's That's opened a lot of doors. Um, I will just say this about patience. I have been doing um, for a few years called In the Hands in October when I asked children's authors to videotape themselves reading their book and I was posting it on a Facebook page. Oh, wow. And so, but God has been putting in my heart to start a nonprofit. And I just got my paperwork last week. And I will say this, because if you're on my newsletter, you will know this because it went out yesterday. In less than three weeks, Rita, I got my nonprofit status. Oh, that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> oh, God is in the business. I have to see what you're doing with that. Yes, uh, I am going to be doing um, the, you know, the the little book nooks, um, and I'm doing this in memory of my son Jason, who had passed away. Oh. And he was he died the day before his second birthday, and he loved books, and so I'm doing it really in in memory of him. And then I'm creating what I call these story walks. And there'll be sections all along, like a park or a library or wherever anybody will let me do it. And there will be pages that are laminated of a children's story. And so you walk across each side and follow the story. Yeah. That's beautiful. And next summer, I'm going to be doing a virtual writers um, uh, conference for um, young people. So it will be like, I'm thinking 11 to 15 and mm -hmm. they will, each week they will see an author or an illustrator or an editor and will create something and that will be published into a book. Oh, that is fantastic. Yeah. Wow. So, and let me just say this. And I mean, you know, I'm not, you know, uh, in my twenties anymore, I'm going to be 72 in October. Yeah. And I will tell you, you know, that is, oh, <laughs> at times I feel it let me just say that I but, get it. <laughs> yes but I, get I will it. say this because I just so love what God does yeah. I just so love when he is in the middle of something and gives you a desire to do something and I feel you know like detours are you know we, we I was praying this before mm -hmm. we started you know sometimes detours are not mm -hmm. a lot of fun 
Mm -hmm. and, and then God will move us in another detour that you know that he is with you. And I'm so excited to be starting this journey. So thank you for asking. Oh, that is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to hear more about it. Okay, you will. And so, I will help you promote it if thank you. If you will allow me, I would love to send stuff out about it. Um, thank you. Well, that'll be happening in a while, you know. I'm just you know, finishing up all the formulating types <laughs> and uh, those kind of things. So it is a process, uh, but um, I'm excited about it. So a, I think that's a marvelous idea. Thank you. Thank I you. don't think I've ever heard of anybody doing that. So, well, it's a God idea. And it's, so I know that I've idea. seen, you know, a few of those kind of things, but um, nothing as to what I believe that God wants me to do. So I'm excited. Um, so let's get to you. Let's go yeah. okay. wait until morning. Oh my gosh. So, uh, let's talk first about researching a book like that and what's involved and, you know, a little bit about that process. And then, uh, is it a standalone or a series book? It's a standalone. Standalone. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So you obviously have to research to do something like this. Yes. Yes. And I'm guessing you want to know how I did it. <laughs> the process. Well, that could be a whole thing right there or, or in, in uh, definitely in a few Zoom meetings, but yeah. maybe just share a little bit about, um, okay, you want to write this book. What did, where did you start? Maybe? Where did I start? Okay. Um, you know, I had, I knew the idea. I knew the time period. So that was a given. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted it to be on the home front. It's not a war novel. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it's set in Alexandria, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And it is set in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. One yeah. of my favorite, favorite places. And it was set in a fictional little town. Mm -hmm. So the little, the fictional town I didn't have any problem with coming up with that on my own, but so I had to, to study a little bit about Alexandria and West and um, Purpose Ferry, West Virginia mm -hmm. in the 1940s. And it wasn't difficult to do, you know, I just went to the, to websites like the history of Alexandria, Virginia. Um, you know, there's the town itself has its own website with historical stuff. So I could read that. Mm -hmm. I, um, same with Harper's Ferry, has got oh, tons and tons of uh, information on the internet about the history of Harper's Ferry. And I've been there. Um, and in fact, when my heroine, Anna, goes to, what, to Harper's Ferry, she's going there to, to be with her sister. Yes. Her sister lives on Ridge road which is a but it, it's ridge road is is it not fictional okay it's a real place it's up on a ridge above right above the town proper of harper's ferry above the potomac river gorge and so having been there and also been through west through um keep saying west virginia mm -hmm. harper's ferry um, you know, I was familiar with, with it and that helps to be able to go to a place. So basically I did that and, you know, then I, I searched websites on uh, fashion of the era and, you know, even down to the makeup the women wore. I mean, they wore yes. victory red lipstick, uh, which was promoted by the federal government telling women, hey, put a kiss on your soldier's letter. Yeah. So women were doing this. They were buying that red lipstick and they'd kiss the envelope and they'd kiss the, the letter and wow. send it off, which I thought was such a neat thing. Um, yeah. I so, love how you put some of that information in the back as well for people to, yeah. yes. Oh yeah. And, um, you know, just basic living things like, you know, um, what did people do during rationing? Mm. So I, I read about rationing. What did, what 
kind of foods were they allowed to have during rationing? Mm -hmm. What was scarce? What was plentiful? Um, and then the thing about the victory gardens, people were planting food. Um, women's were saving their flat, the flower companies put their flour in these sacks, cloth sacks. Women were saving these cloth sacks and the, you know, to make clothes. The companies caught on to this and thought, hey, we can sell more flour if we make the flour sacks pretty. <laughs> and so if you research it online, which I did, and I got to see photographs of original like dresses and children's clothes that were made out of flower sacks. And it was amazing what these women could do, you know? Um, so it just, you know, just kind of like going through the internet and looking up specific things like that, that I wanted, what I was honing in on was trying to make the novel come alive um, that would, people would say, oh, you know, this sounds realistic of how they, how they were living back then, you know, the things that they were going through. So anything I didn't research was sports, <laughs> but just about everything else I did. And one of the most amazing things that happened, at least it was amazing for me, was as I was, sorry, hold That's on. Okay. As I was uh, researching recipes, mm -hmm that, you know, like women cooking back then. I came across an article in a Canadian newspaper and it was about war cake. I thought, hmm. So I'm looking at this recipe. I'm going, that's my mother's applesauce cake recipe. When I was a kid, she made that cake all the time. My dad loved it. And, you know, I always thought that it was something, a recipe that was passed down in the mm -hmm. family, you know, like from the matriarchs in the family, but it turned out that it is, it is the war cake recipe. And which, it's your mother's. Yeah. It didn't have, it didn't have any eggs in it for one. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, it had applesauce in it. It had as molasses and cinnamon and raisins and all. And I'm like, mm -hmm. that's my mom cake <laughs> you know so it really kind of meant something to me that she all this time she was making that war cake recipe so I was able to pass that on to like you know my my siblings and my sure. cousins and they were all like oh my god are you kidding you know I'm like yeah it's the war cake <laughs> I love it I love it and speaking I will give the recipe out to anybody that wants it <laughs> okay I'll take it <laughs> Okay. Anybody you want it, make sure you connect with her and she'll yep. give it to you. So let me know and I'll be so glad speaking of some family members, you have in your dedication uh -huh. Mary Cameron Sullivan, yeah. uh Red Cross nurse and gray lady, World War II, Walter Reed Hospital, my grandmother-in-law. Yes. That's one of them. Yes. And then you have to Lawrence Elroy Plant. U.S. Navy, World War II, your father. And then your son, Michael Cameron Gerlich, uh, who was in the U.S. Navy at this time. Yeah. And can we share a little bit of news about them? Sure. Okay. Um, you know, there's the dates on there for my grandmother-in-law. Yes. I like to call her that because she, she really became a grandma to me. Um, and a great, she was a wonderful, great grandmother to my sons. She was um, a gray lady um, for 50 years. And the gray ladies were volunteers, usually through the Red Cross. They volunteered during the war uh, at the hospitals. They yeah. would visit patients, they'd read to them. They'd, they did everything I love it. that maybe the nurses could not get to doing you know sure. and um they did all kinds of volunteer work they were absolutely amazing she was also a nurse um mm -hmm. and she had i was so inspired to put her in here at, not just because she's served as that during world war ii 
but because she had told me a story before she passed about being a gray lady, that she was supposed to have a day off at Walter Reed and an, an, another nurse volunteer called her and said she couldn't go in if she, would she take her place so mm. she said, sure you know she, she took her place went into work was at the nurse's station this is during the war mm. and they came up in the elevator with a soldier that was in a comatose state mm. who had no dog tag and so they told her, we don't know who he is. He has new dog tags. Mm -hmm. She went over and um, she looked at him and she said, I know exactly who he is. He's my nephew from Massachusetts. Oh, I just got like goosebumps. Oh, I know. Wow. I was like, Nana for real? I called her Nana. She, that's exactly what happened. And so when she passed away, she left Paul, Paul's my husband. She left him and I, her gray lady uniform, pins, mm. even the little scarf she wore, all her memorabilia. Wow. And um, we ended up up here in Frederick, Maryland. They had the national world of what was it red cross the red cross museum mm -hmm. so she asked that we would donate it to them wow and so we did we took it over and donated it and let me tell you her uniform was itty bitty <laughs> it was like how did she get in, she get in it? She was, they were so much thinner than we are <laughs> yes. Yes. i guess they ate better i don't know but yeah her whole everything all her all her memorabilia and wow. they they were happy to get it and um that they were gonna take good care of it so that's a beautiful that so yeah beautiful. and then my my father who is uh i dedicated it to it's pretty explanatory he went into the navy in 1942 he was not a big man and the marines wouldn't take him and the army wouldn't take him and the navy wouldn't take him but the Navy said, if you gain some weight and muscle, then maybe we'll take you. And I guess he didn't pass physical. So <clears throat> he did. He went home and he filled two coffee cans full of concrete, put a wow. hole in it, and made his own weight. <laughs> Bulked himself up. He did get into the Navy and uh, he was all over the place. I mean, he was over in the Atlantic arena and he was in the Pacific arena. He uh, went to Hiroshima after the uh, wow. the dropping of the bomb. And um, yeah, so he, he didn't talk a lot about it, but I wanted to honor him in there. And then my son, Michael, came home one day, six years ago and said, well, I'm gonna follow in my grandfather's footsteps. I talked to a recruiter and my heart went in my th to my shoes, and I was like, "Oh my God! Don't tell me you're going into the Marines or Army, you know, because of Afghanistan, all that going on." And, no, no, I'm going in the Navy. So he's been in the Navy since uh, 2017, and he was trained as um, an MI, which is like military police. Yes. And uh, which he's not doing that presently, but. They went, he had boot camp. We went to boot camp graduation, which was amazing. Then he went to Lackland Air Force Base for training. Mm -hmm. And they were going to send him to Bahrain. And I was, please, God, don't let them send my son to Bahrain. <laughs> I didn't want him to go to the Middle East. It was too volatile over there. Sure. And uh, the day before he was to leave, they changed his orders. Mm -hmm. And they sent him to Puget Sound up in Washington. Wow. And he met his wife and they've been happily married for three years and having their first child. So he's your first grandbaby. Yep. You know, <laughs> first grandbaby. And uh, he's presently deployed. Okay. So he, so you, uh, you need to continue to pray for him. Thank you very much. Daughter-in-law uh, and this new baby that's coming. Yeah. He's um, over in the Pacific. So okay. 
Yeah, he's in expeditionary forces, which is kind of like, it's like a step down from SEALs. And, okay. But he's okay. All right, praise God. Yes. I didn't get to hear from him for about two months. They went on a mission and mm. I was yes. you know, nervous, but finally they, he's back at base right. in Guam. Good and, praise God for that. All right. Thank God for the internet because we're able to do messenger and uh, wonderful. Yeah. face chat. So. Yeah, it's Thank great. You. So let's talk a little bit more about your book. Maybe you could okay. share, um, wait until morning, kind of share a little bit about some of the characters and what's actually happening. Okay. And we don't want to give away the book. So you no, know, I'll try not to give away anything. <laughs> um, Anna Aubrey is my heroine. Yes. And uh, she, in the beginning, uh, I don't want to give away the book. <laughs> okay. Well, just share whatever you feel you want to share. I'll tell you kind of like maybe what her, what she's like, you know, her personality, whatever. Uh, she's a very, she's a strong young woman, but she's also very dedicated and um, committed to helping with the war effort as a volunteer at the Red Cross. And um, she lives in Alexandria, Virginia with her mother and the patriarch of the family, which is her cousin, Freddie. Mm -hmm. um, Freddie is kind of my, uh, he's not really a villain, but he's not the good guy either. He's uh, very uh, argumentative and authoritative and uh, wants to run her life and um, not a very nice person. Yes. So he does not uh, approve of what she's doing and she, she ends up meeting um Daniel and they fall in love with each other and uh, he is an army medic mm -hmm. he ends up being deployed to Europe and then there's her oh gosh my brain I'm getting a brain fog here that's okay <laughs> of the characters names yeah um her sister uh, her husband is also in Europe yes. and she has a little girl named Georgie who is adorable and uh, they live in Harpers Ferry. So those are pretty much the main characters and what, what I tried to do in the book, um, her mother's name is Avila and it's the three of them have their their men are all part of this of the war. Mm -hmm. So they're separated from their, their husbands and Anna is separated from her fiance. So what I tried to do, what I tried to attempt to do in this story was bring these three women together and, and try to convey what it was like for the women, the mothers, mm -hmm the fiancés and the wives of the men during World War II that were deployed. What was it like for them? And I, and I reflected a lot on my own grandmothers um, with their sons uh, in, you know, who were deployed. My, my one grandmother had four that were deployed, two in the Pacific, two over in Europe, mm -hmm. two in concentration camps. Yes. Um, and then my other grandmother, my father's mother, he, he was her only child, only son. Mm -hmm. And what they must have gone through because they had no communication for the entire time. They had very little communication, I should say. Uh, they did write, they could write, and th they had what was called victory mail. Ooh, did you hear that? I did. Thunder. <laughs> We're going to get a big old thunderstorm. We've had that. <laughs> I love it. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the, the women in this story, they have to support each other through this time period. Mm -hmm. The men didn't get leave, yeah. you know, like my son could get leave, you know, maybe, well, well, not right now, but he has gotten leave before, put in for it, you get a couple weeks leave. Yes. During World War II, some of these men were gone for four years, sometimes yeah. five. Without I, had, I had two family. uncles serving uh, during World War II, and, um, yeah. and both of them were in uh, your POWs as well. 
Oh, wow. And so um, yeah, they like, came back home, but it's definitely, uh, and you said earlier how they didn't talk about things, and it's so true. No, they, they didn't. Did not, um, they yeah, they didn't. And I had, my uncles went through, all four of them went through a pretty rough time over there. My dad too, but fortunately being in the Navy, it was a little different. Yes. You know? Yes. So the so basically the I hope that gives you kind of a an idea of what yes. these women were facing. It does. And how it molded their characters. Mm -hmm. Um where Anna, she ends up being the support system for like everybody. And everybody else is, you know, grieving or or missing their their husbands. Um without giving too much of the story away. Yeah. I could easily do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but um, I love her as a character. And, um, you know. Uh, and so maybe just tell us um, the title. Is there something about the title? Um, I, I chose that title because there is a conversation in the book. Mm -hmm. And without giving a lot away, <laughs> Yes. where someone says that to her you just have to wait until morning yes and it just kind of like stuck to me yeah wait until morning and you know it's kind of metaphorical mm -hmm. that you know sometimes you know during the night hours during the times of darkness you know um when we're going through things we wait for that for dawn the dawn to come we wait for the morning to come we have to wait for it for the light to come back to things to get better you know um and and have that hope you wait just wait on the lord wait for morning to come wait for him to resolve situations yeah. and bring light back into your life when you're when you're going through a really really difficult time in your life and which we all we all yeah. experience that which we have all experienced yes mm -hmm. um one of the things i love that you do in your book is you have this section about bits of historical interest you talk about seabiscuit i love that story mm -hmm. yeah and at asta and the lux radio theater and you talk about the red cross as well but you talk about literature and wartime films Pride and Prejudice, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. I've seen all these. Um, Life Magazine, you talk about that. The Wind in the Willows, I've seen, yes. And The Secret Garden, yes. I love them all. Mm -hmm. Road Not Taken. Yes. And The Women's Home Companion. But you also put in music. So I'm like, I love to read and I love music. And so Send Me Away with a Smile. Yeah. Stardust. And I, this is one of my favorite songs. You'll never know how much I love you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. And I've got a feeling I'm falling in love. And there's so much more in here. And you talk about spam as well in the back. And <laughs> there's so many, so many great things. Um, I almost now want to look at the back of the book first to see what you put in there. So that <laughs> oh. kind of reflect and go and I'm reading and say, oh, yeah, that was in the back. Let me look a little bit more about that. So, um Okay, so let well, me yeah, can I can I just say one one yeah. thing here? Well, two things. Um, for when people read the back and they see like for the music and those songs, mm -hmm. if you go to YouTube and you type in that title of that song, mm -hmm. you can hear original versions. Yes, and that's what I did. I went through all these songs from the forties, fell in love with swing music. Oh yeah. Um, but as far as spam, I thought it was so kind of like funny um, in a way. And I had to add that in. And if I, I'll just read a line, I'll just read oh, yeah. I had a reader uh, contact me and she said, I think this is my favorite line in the book. Wow. All right. And Anna is with her uncle mm -hmm. and she goes to visit him and she, he has made a meal for them, for him, her and Georgie. Mm -hmm. and, and it says, Uncle Stephen leaned his elbows on the table. I learned a dozen different ways to cook Spam. <laughs> we had to 
during the depression. There's a lot you can do with a can of Spam. Fry it, grind it, grill it, eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It isn't called the miracle meat for nothing. <laughs> and that's what they did. They called, that was one of the things they called it. They it's did. The they did. meat. I remember <laughs> seeing that. Um, my mom used to buy some of that as well. So yeah. my boys, <coughs> I've been sipping mm -hmm. tea. I'm, I think I'm beginning to lose it. Okay. No problem. So um, what's, what's coming up? We know that Mercy's Refuge, you're writing a sequel. Yeah. And um, anything else you want to share and maybe sure. share the website and then people can, I'll okay. post that in, but let people know. Okay. Um, with The Waymaker, it's going to be a while before I get that book out, before mm -hmm. that book comes out. Uh, a good historical should take a while. Yes. Um, you know, a good historical fiction, um, most that is, you know, is really historically accurate and and everything should take at least a writer i would personally say a year to do mm -hmm. instead of like a rush job and there's a lot there you'll find those every once in a while but good historical fiction takes a while to write and once i finish the first draft i'm about eight chapters in so i have a lot more to do and once I finish the draft for that book, I have to go back, do rewriting, do editing, send it to beta readers, and then move forward with publishing. Um, then, let's see, um, I got the rights back from one of my Barber novellas, and um, it's called The Wedding of the Waters. It's a historical, romance of 1819 in New York and I'm going to be they're they're starting to like reissue their novellas mm -hmm. to, to back to writers when when their collections go out of print okay. so I have five with them and I plan to take those as I'm getting them back and reissuing them as ebooks mm -hmm. on Amazon okay um and they're short they're novellas they're like 50 pages, 80 page, maybe 80 pages long. So they're not very long. Um, but I do have also a, a book um, that I'm going to work on that I kind of started that I'll do after The Waymaker. And I'm not going to give too much away. Don't, don't, no, it's, my, it's my, it's my um, secret mission book. <laughs> but it's, um, it's a retelling Mm. of a very old novel that was popular in its day that uh, people that are like literature majors or uh, his literature historians, they would recognize the author. They would know. But mm -hmm. most people probably would not know this. But it's a retelling of a historical. Okay. And the book that she wrote, this particular author, was first published in 1899, mm -hmm. and um, she was a Virginian, and it is a, it's a historical set yeah. 1600s, Virginia, and it's told in her, she told it in first person in the male character. Mm -hmm. What I plan to do is do a retelling, third person, in the story of the heroine that was in her book. Wow. And, um, you know, it'll probably be, a, it's going to be a major thing for me. So that's well, going to be for those. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got a lot going on. And then my website is basically Rita Gerlach at wordpress.com. I'm also, I'm on Facebook. I have an author's page on Facebook. Yes. And, um, love for people to come on there because what I do on my author's page, I'll, I'll share what I'm working on and I'll share some of the historical facts, like with Mercy's Refuge. Oh, gosh. Oh, I remember uh, looking at it as I was reading it. It was incredible. Uh, yeah, I was sharing all kinds of information I was finding out, like when they were crossing the Atlantic, the main beam in the, in the Mayflower cracked. 
Mm -hmm. They were going to die. It was going, the ship was going to break apart during a storm. But they were smart enough that they brought this screw thing, big screw thing that shores up like ceilings. And they, they put it underneath the crack, shored it up, got it back in place, and they made it over. It was a miracle. Yeah. In my I book. reading that and thinking, oh my gosh, I just, you never know that you're not told that, you know. Uh, yeah, you don't hear about some of this stuff. But, yeah. you know, I, I found out about it from reading William Bradford's diary because yes. he wrote about it. There was so much in his diary that, you know, people don't know the story, like sure. when his wife, Dorothy Bradford, fell off the ship in Plymouth Harbor and drowned. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, the Mayflower eventually went back to England. It was auctioned off. This landowner bought all the timber from the ship. And you can go to England to, his, to the barn on this land. And you can see the main beam. Wow. He kept it and it's a main beam in the barn. It's got the crack in it. You know, so I shared stuff, you know, like that on the uh, author's page. It was yeah, a lot it's of fun. pretty fascinating. It but really it was, And it was fun. It was fun. I try to make it fun. You do. You do very well. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to say, first of all, thank you to you. Um, it's always such a pleasure to hang out with you and talk about writing. Well, if you can hear me, thank you very much. Really, it's great.